Welcome to today's webinar entitled, Effective Handoffs to Ensure a Smooth Transition of Care. My name is Danielle and I will be your operator for today's call. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Please direct your attention to your computer screen as we cover the webinar platform functionality. Please note that you may need to zoom in or out from your browser to see everything. In the middle of your browser, you will see a box containing today's slides. They will advance automatically throughout the presentation. To the right of the slides, you will see a Q&A box to submit a question at any time. Your questions will be addressed during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. To the left of the slides, you will see a resource list containing a PDF of today's slides and a few other helpful resources. If you are on the phone line but are experiencing technical difficulties accessing the web portion, please let us know by sending an email to webinars at perfectserve.net. At this time, I will now turn things over to today's moderator, Heather Dorsett, Director of Marketing with Perfect Serve. Heather, you may begin. Thank you, Danielle, and welcome everyone to Perfect Serve's Thought Leadership Webinar Series. For those of you who may not know us, know Perfect Serve, we provide healthcare's only comprehensive and secure communications and collaboration solution, uniting physicians, nurses, and other care team members across the continuum in more than 165 hospitals and more than 25,000 physician practices and post-acute providers. This webinar series is a part of Perfect Serve's ongoing promise to drive meaningful improvement in care delivery. Uh, and we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for your time. Before we get started, just a few items to note. Today's webinar is being recorded um, <clears throat> for our friends and colleagues who are unable to join us, and you'll be able to access uh, the webinar later on as well. As an audience member, you are in listen-only mode, so please do make use of the Q&A box uh, to communicate with our speakers or with me today. We will launch three polls throughout the webinar uh, to submit your answers. All you have to do is type in the open text box located on, right on the slide. And finally, at the conclusion of today's event, we, ask, we will ask that you complete a short survey that will appear in a separate browser window. We are so pleased today to be partnering with the CEU Institute to offer continuing education credit. Uh, you must stay for the duration of the webinar to receive the credit. You must answer each of the three polling questions to confirm your attendance throughout the webinar. Uh, learners who remain for the entirety of the program will be entire, entitled to one hour of continuing education for CNAs, LPNs, RNs, and ARNPs. Uh, all attendees will receive an email from the CEU Institute with a credit submission link, uh, and you must fill out and submit the credit submission link within, or you must, um, you must click the link and submit the credit submission within 72 business hours upon receipt, after which the link will close. So keep that in mind. Uh, within 72 hours of receiving the link, you must complete the submission in order to get your credit. Uh, included with the link will be certificates for your records. If you have additional questions, you can contact the CEU Institute at ceuinstitute.net. And it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Denise Barbera is the Chief Nursing Officer with HealthSouth. She has over 30 years of nursing leadership experience in the acute care environment. And in addition to her bachelor's in nursing, Denise also has a master's degree in organizational management, and she completed the Wharton Nursing Leadership Program through the University of Pennsylvania. Karen Krupkala is the Workers' Compensation Liaison and Marketing Coordinator for Help South Sunrise and Help South Miami Rehabilitation Hospitals. She brings over 20 years of experience in the hospital and healthcare setting. At this time, I will pass things over to Denise to get us started. Denise, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Again, my name is Denise Barbera, and I want to thank you for giving me your time and your very busy schedule today. As she said, I'm the Chief Nursing Officer at Health South Sunrise. We're a rehabilitation hospital in Sunrise, Florida. 
So my goal today is to give you a bit of insight into the importance and challenges nurses face providing quality handoff during the transition of care. So the purpose of the presentation is to educate on the importance of the handoff, elicit smooth transition of care to the patient, and we'll review standard approach to handoff, including opportunities to ask questions and respond. So first, to define care transition. Care transition is defined as a hospital discharge or movement from one hospital care setting to another. There are many steps in this transition of care. There's the planning, the identification of patient needs and goals, transition planning needs and follow-up for both the sending and receiving providers, patient and family preparation, which is most important, med reconciliation, near and dear to my heart, communication and collaborating to minimize barriers that interfere with the patient's safety. So there's been a lot of um, news lately and a lot of uh, in healthcare news about the problems of hospital readmissions. So hospital readmissions cost healthcare systems $17.4 billion annually. 19.6% of patients were readmitted to acute care facilities within 30, within 30 days of discharge. Adverse events were found to occur in as many as 23% of discharge patients. 72% of those were medication errors. The role of the nurse in care transition is crucial. The predominant emerging themes in the literature stress the importance of nurses as the key communicators and collaborators in the coordination of patient care and the need for them to take an active role in care transition. The one key action in transition of care is the communication during handoff process, which is what we're going to focus on today. So handoff is the transfer process will provide for the safe and timely transfer of the patient to include up-to-date information on the patient's care, treatment, meds, services, and any anticipated changes. So you see on the slide here we have information on football. So handoff is not just for healthcare. Handoff is at any point um, within the life spectrum. So the quarterback is the equivalent of our case manager. They create the plan. They talk about what's going to happen. They devise the plays. They have to share it with the entire team so the handoff can be seamless. The difference between football and healthcare is we're handing off a person. So it's more crucial that our handoff be smooth, clean, and provide the safest transition from one place to the next. Handoff communication is a JCO, a Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goal, developed for hospitals and went into effect in 2006. The goals of handoff are to provide information in the same manner each time. So the standardization is what creates the safety. It's verbal, face-to-face, -face, by telephone. It's a two-way exchange of information, limiting distractions and interruptions. There are three phases to handoff, exchanging the information, Transferring the responsibility of care. This is probably one of the trickiest parts. When does that responsibility transfer over? At the time of the report or at the time the patient is received at the new facility or the new area? Providing continuity of care by preparing the team to take over so they're able to anticipate and make timely decisions. Breaches and handoff have dire consequences. There's medication errors, wrong site surgeries, and patient deaths. So one example that circulated um, through the literature, stories that you hear anecdotally, a patient going to the OR, the nurse receives the patient in the OR, they go through their timeout, she's looking and she's looking at the documents and something is wrong. She's not sure, but she just knows something's wrong. She asks the team to wait. The doctor says, this is Mrs. Smith, she's here for a right mastectomy, he's ready to cut. She puts her hand down to stop him. He, of course, is livid. He drags her down to administration. How dare she stop his surgery? It was the wrong patient. Had she not stopped, had she not communicated, what would have happened? The consequences would be dire. The other question, that would be a different CEU. If she was wrong, what would the outcome have been? Just something to think about. So now we'll hand it back over to Heather for our questions. Hi, yes, thanks. Uh, so this is the first of our three polling questions. How can handoff contributors to medication errors be addressed and decreased? So we'll give everyone a, um, about a minute or so to go ahead and put your answers in the field there. Um, and then we will move on to the next, uh, the next section of content. 
So repeat again, how can handoff contributors to medication errors be addressed and decreased? While we wait um, for some answers to populate, medication reconciliation across the continuum is a huge challenge and one that nursing leaders, hospital leaders really need to take a critical look at, especially when a patient goes to a subacute facility. We're receiving patients from all different types of facilities, acute cares, uh, SNFs, long-term care, uh, acute care facilities. Different hospitals will have a different MAR. They'll have a different process from one place to the other, how they reconcile it. Now all those different patients will come to our facility and we have to figure out what is the best thing to give that patient. So it really is crucial for both sides to really look at how they're reconciling the medication and then communicating those medication lists as the patient crosses the continuum. Okay, let's look. I think we have some answers. And that. All right, um, while we gain some of those answers, we'll just go on to the next slide. All right, um, when, do we do, or when do we provide handoff? We provide handoff at the change of shift. At break, break time, someone has to cover the patients while you're away. Transfers within the department, so a patient goes to the ER, then has to go up to the floor to the ICU. This is always a challenging one because there's a huge disconnect between what the ER nurse thinks she needs to share versus what the ICU nurse thinks she needs to receive. Procedures going to the OR or to a, radio, a radiology procedure, transferring from acute uh, from, or subacute back to acute, and discharging to any level of care. Yes. Yeah. Going back, this is Karen. Going back to the question that was asked. The answers are a lot, and I appreciate it. We talk about accountability and thoughtful education, report errors and share the errors with the professional creating the error, uh, be having clear communication and proper handoff, streamline and ease of med reconciliation, verbal report at transfer to acute care facilities to confirm accuracy of written documents, Ask the medication instructions to be repeated back to ensure understanding, communication, and read back. Medication reconciliation, standardized order sets for SNFs for complete orders, sending the summary of care. Read back of medication from discharge nurse to admission nurse. Using a teach back method within report between staff. Actually taking the time to, in capital letters, do the handoff. Look particularly for meds that either counteract, counteract each other or medications in the same classes being ordered. Face-to-face -face handoff and discussion about what has been given, what is still needed, and what time frame for our PRNs. Sorry. Written as well as oral orders, proper documentation, bedside report, med rec completed, discussed as a group action plan, written medication list reviewed with patient before they leave hospital, and the same written med list sent to the post-acute provider, repeat backs and good reports. By reviewing all medication and supplements the patient should be taking prior to discharge, can also be readdressed in follow-up call, Send a copy with the patient of what they should be taking and what they should be discontinuing. Med rec first have to be reported, including near misses, analyzed and developed corrective action plan and good documentation. Verify of home medication list with order sets. Double checks during reconciliation, standardization, medication rec and use SPAR. Uh, phonetic and numeric clarification and read and repeat back all the order and order needs. Great feedback, guys. Now back to Denise. So I see uh, Jacqueline's answer about actually taking time to do the handoff, which as we're talking about here, you know, the different places or times that you do it, 
And that's actually key. You need to take the time to do it. But what we recognize as nurse leaders, is there's a lot of barriers to handoff. There's admissions that change a shift. There's giving them time to conduct the conversation. Lack of the sender's knowledge. Focus on tasks rather than outcomes. And unfortunately, as a nursing profession, especially with computerized documentation, we've definitely delved into the task mode rather than thinking through the outcomes. Use of contract labor. One recent study showed that more than 37% of the time, handoff is deficient and does not allow the receiver to adequately take care of the patient. One thing we've started here at Health South Sunrise is monitoring the handoff process. We're actually signing the staff off on competencies. And this is actually my measure. When I am listening to their handoff, could I take care of this patient? If I can't, they do not pass the competency. This is taking us a while to accomplish, but it's actually going to make it better at the bedside. Defective handoff is also known to cause problems beyond adverse events, such as delays in care, inappropriate treatment, and increased length of stay. There's many root causes for a defective hand handoff, a culture that doesn't promote it. As leaders, we have to ensure that the staff have the time and the resources in order to accomplish it, and that they know how to do it. Differing expectations between the sender and the receiver, inability of the sender to follow up with the receiver if there are questions. This is another huge opportunity for us, especially with the situation in South Florida and the transportation of the patient. Our patients arrive very late in the day. So they could have been cared for by the acute care nurse all day long. There's change of shift, and that's when the patient leaves. They now arrive here around 8 or so, and now the nurse who cared for that patient in the acute care facility is gone. There's nobody to call to ask for follow-up if we had any questions. Um, the, there's omissions in data, there's distractions, and then there's incomplete medical records. So a few examples of some real-life debacles and handoffs. Recently, we had a patient show up from an acute care facility, and typically what happens, the ambulance unloads the patient, they bring them to the front desk, that's where they're received, and they're, the PBS operator checks them off. Well, this patient wasn't on the list. We weren't expecting him. So now everybody's scrambling. We got no report, nobody called, no orders. I can't take him in the back. I can't put him in the bed. So now I have a frightened old man lying on the stretcher in a hospital gown and a thin blanket in the lobby. This is not a good look. So we scramble. We get the orders. We had been looking to receive him, but we were expecting him the next day. So we had some information. We got the orders. We got what we needed to get him admitted but it eroded the trust that this patient had in our healthcare team, and that team was the two facilities, talking to one another to ensure his safe passage from one to the other. So what are some of the tools that we use? Obviously, we have the medical record. That's our primary source, and we use um, information, whether it's written, verbal, or via telephone. Typically, facilities will send copies from the medical records, such as the MAR, as DCMAR, HMP, post-op reports. But often, we are missing things like the actual EKG and results of certain diagnostic tests, such as an MBS swallow study. So these two are critical for us in rehab. For instance, if a patient has an episode of chest pain, we do an EKG. Without that prior EKG from acute, we don't know what's happening. It could be angina, there's no EKG changes, I could keep the patient or watch them a little longer. Without it, the doctors are not going to take any chances, they're going to send the patient back, we now have a readmission. For the MBS swallow study, without it, we don't know what kind of diet the patient should be on. We may have to repeat the test, which is not always necessary, so that's a wasted resource, but they could get the incorrect diet or have a delay in diet and neither would be good. It's my opinion that it's the verbal, verbal report that's most crucial. The bedside nurse who has cared for that patient knows the patient's needs as they travel through the care continuum. Recently, we had a patient who transferred from, uh, we got report from a nurse uh, at an acute care facility. We were getting a traumatic brain injury patient who had a history of drug abuse. She had shared with the receiving nurse that the patient was on Ativan and it had just been DC'd and she was concerned. So our nurse, this gave her the opportunity to go have a conversation with the admitting physician who actually delayed the, discharge, uh, delayed the admission for a day. They were able to have time to evaluate the patient to see if there would be a change in condition. They modified his medication plan. 
came to us the next day without incident, and he was discharged home. And that is the perfect story. One tool in handoff between nursing and physician is SBAR. We've been hearing about this for years. There's different methods that people use to do it, whether it's written, built into the computer system. But it does help in providing a succinct and concise report to a physician. So SBAR is defining the situation, the background, giving an assessment, and what recommendation, what you're looking for. So what is SBAR? It was developed by the military and adopted into healthcare about 2002. The main purpose was to alleviate communication problems traced from the differences in communication styles between healthcare professionals. It's a standardized way for healthcare professionals to communicate effectively and succinctly to convey critical information to one another to protect patient safety. This framework gives the receiver all the information necessary to make informed decisions about the patient's care and it gives the sender a structured format in which to communicate. S, it's a concise statement of the problem. So for example, Mr. Jones is getting discharged. He has multiple prescriptions for Coumadin in his home and it's unclear which one he's to take. B, background. This is the time you want to share some information. You might want to give the information about the patient's history, diagnosis, who the prescribing physicians were, the dates and dosages of the medication. A, the assessment. This is where you've analyzed and considered some options. What needs to occur? And R, your recommendations, Request, requesting what you want. So in the case of Mr. Jones, please clarify the correct dose of Coumadin for this patient and which physician will be responsible for managing his anticoagulation therapy. Another example of just report, um, and this came from the literature while I was doing the research, and it just actually explains all parts of the handoff and why it's so important, even this simple little example. Nurse Brown on Unit A is going to receive report from Nurse Green, who's transferring a patient. The patient's medication administration record does not indicate that he received any pain med in the last shift. When Nurse Brown asked Ms. Green the question, she realizes she did give him morphine, she just didn't document it. Because Nurse Brown questioned Nurse Green, she realized she omitted the documentation, she was able to correct it, she communicated the medication given, thus preventing accidental overdose of the medication. Because we know sometimes the patients get confused whether or not they received meds and very easily could have had an overdose. And now back to Heather for the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so here's the second of our three polling questions. Uh, what are the critical data, excuse me, what are the critical data elements that should be transferred by type of service, specialty, profession, and setting? And again, we'll give you uh, uh, about a minute or so to type in your answer there. And I'll read it once again. What are the critical data elements that should be transferred by type of service, specialty, profession, profession and setting? Sorry. As we are um, waiting for some responses, just some other examples of handoff. When a patient um, changes levels of care, that's the equivalent of going to surgery. So the patient comes back from surgery, they haven't been up yet, and communicating to the oncoming nurse, this patient's a change in fall risk because now they've had a surgical procedure. Receiving critical test results, making sure you read those back to ensure that you've got the proper patient, the proper results, so that you can follow that, whatever process your facility follows in order to get that handled and taken care of. So it looks like we have two responses in. Remember how to get them? No. Oh, oh we more have one than, than two. two. Okay. So in regards to this question, answers are so far any clinical psycho psychosocial information that falls into the SPAR template. SBAR facts. Those items decided on by the specific area. Diagnosis, current treatment, and medication list. Patient's name and age, reason for admission, and pertinent comorbidities, code status, current isolation or precautions, elopement risk, labs, 
pending and pertinent abnormal findings, pertinent abno abnormal diagnostic study, pertinent assessment <laughs> findings appropriate to patients' current health care issues, fall risk, electronic clinical dashboard. Uh, medications, allergies, diagnosis, patient name, and date of birth. Mm -hmm. So I would like to congratulate uh, Jane. She's psychic because if we go to our next slide. Talking about shift, whoops, huh? one too many. Nope. Shift to shift or unit to unit handoff, a lot of what was talked about is actually on this slide. And going back to Linda, she talked about items needed to be decided by the specific area. That's actually very key. It's very helpful for the frontline staff to define the components of handoff depending on the, where the transition is. So a patient going to the OR, that report will look very different than a patient who's leaving acute and going to subacute or to long-term care. So shift to shift report, again, is making sure you're using patient identifiers. Do you have the right patient? So making sure it's the patient's name. Engaging the patient in the dialogue is crucial. When I do watch our bedside shift report here at Health South, um, I witnessed two nurses, and they both taken care of the patient before, and the patient had received their um, discharge date, and they were going home in two days. They had a little party right then and there celebrating her success, how well she's done, and the engagement between all three of them, you could see this patient clearly trusted this team and felt comfortable with them, and they were truly excited about her progress and her being able to go home back into the community. That's what this is all about. Uh, making sure that you have the code status. If I'm walking into a room cold and I know nothing about that patient and we're going in together to do bedside shift report, I want to know the code status, especially if we walk into a change in condition. But uh, structuring and creating standardization takes the guesswork out and reduces variability, thus increasing safety. You want to make sure you have the opportunity to verify any information received. So when you're having a verbal dialogue, whether it be face-to-face -face or on the phone, you can repeat things back. When you're taking information such as a critical test result, you want to read back to ensure that it's accurate. Have the opportunity to ask and respond to questions. As our little slide shows, the telephone game, during the telephone game, you can easily trans, uh, corrupt information from one person to the next. We've all played this game when we were kids, and it's quite humorous when you're playing this game, what the original comment looks like versus the last comment. It's not so funny when it's related to patient care. So in order to promote the concept of active communication, as nurse leaders, we need to make the staff feel comfortable asking questions. They need to be able to verify there are no stupid questions, and we need to make sure staff feel supported. Staff need to hold each other accountable to the process in the name of patient safety. They have to participate appropriately and not take shortcuts. I know that 12-hour shifts is a very long shift and people are tired, but if you take a shortcut, it could mean life or death for somebody. The handoff communication process does not work if the sending and receiving staff do not work as a team. In addition to providing time for discussion, we have to make it as interruption-free as possible, and this is challenging, especially with some of the barriers we discussed before, admissions at change of shift, just the normal chaos of the day. We need to be able to provide an environment that's conducive to the discussion. That means interruption-free, quiet enough that each party can be heard. So for, what, for us at Health South, one of the things we did is we redesigned our nurse's aid function at change of shift. So they are continuously rounding, answering lights to give the nurses opportunities to be at the bedside and have that discussion. It does work well in the evening shift report, but in the morning, it's very chaotic because we're getting patients ready for therapy. We've yet to de uh, devise a process to make that interruption free. So they are on speed when they're giving report in the morning to try to get everything done. So we have a little more work ahead of us. And back to Heather for the question. Sure. So here's our uh, third and final poll question for today's webinar. 
what are the best techniques for assuring critical information is forwarded and not omitted or overlooked when received? And once again, we'll give you a minute or so to answer. And I'll repeat one more time. What are the best techniques for assuring critical information is forwarded and not omitted or overlooked when received? All right, we have some responses in. Okay, checklists, accepting and handing off both, uh, nurse both sign. Bedside report, with the use of the electronic record for reference when giving and getting report. Create hard stops when transferring electronic health information. Communication between the sources, repeat back and allow questions. Read back asking questions. Use a discharge checklist standardized process. Checklist from sending facility what they need. Educate staff on a standardized process for handoff. All very good suggestions and um, I think it was one, one result Allowing to um, ask questions, but actually utilizing the medical, the electronic record. Denise brought that up. One of the things that we've stressed with our staff, we use ACIT for as our electronic medical record, and they actually bring the computer in. It has a dashboard on it. It has all the information right there. You can go right into your MAR. You can go right into any overdue task. So it is a very clean way, um, and the, the information is right at your fingertip. So some other tools that we use as far as um, handoff communication, obviously we utilize telephone conversation, face-to-face -face communication, and we're communicating with each other throughout the day. Any changes in condition, physician, family issues, equipment needs. We also use verbal cues. So here at Health South, we have tags and cards. The tags on the wheelchairs are stars. We have a red star for patients who have sacral to cubes and we have yellow stars for patients who are extremely high risk for falls that cannot be left alone in the wheelchair. So those are cues for the staff that for the patient with the red star, as soon as they come back from therapy, we need to get them back into bed so we can offload. For the patient with the yellow star, they cannot be left alone. So if there's nobody in the room or we can't get them back to bed, they're at the nurse's station um, in our common area so they can be observed at all times. We also have signs on the doors and that's for all caregivers or any visitors if there were any isolation needs. When our therapists or our therapy techs bring patients back and forth to the room, they're expected to give a handoff. So they will find the nurse, and it always has to be a licensed professional, and they will hand off how well the patient did in therapy, that they're back in the room. If they can't find them physically, they call them on their ASCOM phones, and then they have the conversation. At this time, the dialogue is, to ensure that safety needs are met and any customer service needs that might be outstanding. And I'm going to share with you an example of handoff gone terribly wrong. Patient is <laughs> 90 year old patient with a history of severe osteoporosis, has a sitter with her at all times, is picked up by the rehab tech to go to therapy. The sitter asks, if she could leave, she was going to go to lunch, and he said she'll be about 30 minutes. He takes her to therapy. Her therapy is canceled because it had happened earlier in the day. He brings her back into the room. She doesn't want to go in the room. She's cold. She wants to go sit outside. It was a beautiful day. He brings her outside. He leaves her on the patio. She comes in. Uh, he comes back in. He sees the aide as she's wheeling another patient out for discharge. And oh, by the way, I left Mrs. Smith outside on the patio. The aide knew that that was probably a bad idea and figured she'll go pick her up when she comes back after dropping this patient off. He also shared it with the secretary who just said, okay. The nurse manager a few minutes later looks out her window of her office and sees an empty wheelchair, stands up to find the patients on the floor. So this fall occurred because the patient was left unattended. They quickly brought the patient back into the room and the only negative outcome she had at that time was a skin tear from the fall. 
Within about two hours, she decompensated and was transferred back to acute. The root cause of this whole thing was the lack of communication to the rehab tech that the therapy was canceled because she would have never left the room. But then there were multiple risk points throughout. The failure to communicate to the nurse, the failure for the uh, nursing uh, aide to speak up to say that patient can't be left there. So we can see how critical the handoff communication is and that we would actually save this fall. Other tools are shift huddles. Shift huddles are excellent interdisciplinary huddles to communicate to the entire team any risk issues. Uh, certain patients are at high risk for fall, so if you see the light go on, run in there. Um, any service issues that are going on. The use of the whiteboards. During our um, shift report, the oncoming nurse will go into the room, update the board with her name, any pertinent information for the day that they're already aware of, and that board is used throughout the day. And recently, just to brag a little bit, we had a Joint Commission survey last week to recertify us for all of our Joint Commission disease-specific certifications, and he was extremely impressed on the use of the whiteboard because every patient that he spoke to actually could speak to the board and knew what information was on the board. So that actually warmed my heart knowing that they were really using it. <laughs> um, um, as I stated before, at HealthSouth, we use ACIT for EMR, and this, is, this has the electronic dashboard for the patient and all the information used. And again, we can go into the MAR and review it with the oncoming nurses as well as any outstanding tasks and look up diagnostics if we need to. You know the patient received blood the day before, you can look up the hemoglobin all with a click. So it does make the use of the information very easy and right there at the bedside. The benefits of a smooth handoff are huge. The stakeholder, obviously, the major one being our patient, and a smooth handoff will create patient safety, a good discharge process for the discharging hospital, smooth admission to the next um, care facility. Communication supports the foundation of patient care. Effective handoff increases patient satisfaction and trust in the team, thus increasing patient anxiety. And we know patient satisfaction is all about the anxiety of the patient. If we can build that trust, decrease their anxiety, their experience will be great. Good communication reduces readmission, reduces mortality, provides for the safety of the patient, and decreases length of stay. And although there are many steps and players in the transition of care, communication is the most crucial and significant risk point. Effective communication at any point in the transition directly affects the outcomes for our patients. And then in regards to the smooth handoff, what Denise has on the screen, at the bottom of the screen they talk about case managers and adjusters. I'm the workers' comp liaison, and it's crucial when I have communication with the outside case managers in admitting a patient and then transition from our inpatient to either home health or then going on the best goal is home health and outpatient, there needs to be a smooth communication between the clinical staff and the non-clinical staff, which generally speaking on this slide you see the name adjusters. When we deal with the workers' comp realm, there is adjusters, case managers, which are usually nurses that work for the adjusting or the payers of the claim. We also have field case managers that visit in the acute care hospitals and the post-acute, um, the rehab hospitals like HealthSouth, and also go to the home health or go to the home. So there's many moving parts to have a smooth transition of care and carry this baton on to ensure that the patient has a smooth recovery. So it's really important that you have liaisons or someone that can navigate with the nursing staff and the non-nursing staff, the clinicians and the adjusters and the case managers to have a, a flow of care. It's critically important to all patients, but there's a couple more moving parts when you're talking on the workers' comp realm. And one example regarding the workers' comp, we did have a patient we received through workers' comp and came from an acute care facility, and this patient was gonna need surgery. So we already knew upon admission that they were going to go out within about a week for a surgical procedure. So that's planned for. What we didn't know initially was there were certain 
appointments that were scheduled. Now we plan our, our therapy schedule um, day one. The patient has the week planned out. When we know there are outside appointments, we rearrange the therapy around those appointments. If we don't know about those appointments, that's missed therapy for the patient, which is not a good thing. It's a mistreatment. So with the communication between the workers' comp um, coordinator and with Karen, we found out about the appointments, were able to put them on the schedule, no missed appointment, surgery on time, and no missed therapy. So the communication in that regard had a very positive outcome, and the patient did as well. So now we're heading into the question and answer period. I want to thank you for your time, and we'll hand this back to Heather. Uh, sure. Thank you, Denise and Karen. Uh, we will now head into the Q&A portion. Um, and as a reminder, you can submit any questions uh, for our speakers using the Q&A box located on the lower left-hand side of the webinar platform. Uh, and we do have a few questions that have come in. So let's get started on these. Uh, Dawn asks, um, it's a logistical question uh, that you, uh, you noted some readmission quotes and data at the beginning of the webinar, but we didn't see it in this slide. So will, the, will you have, uh, do you have a resource or something that you can provide uh, to the attendees that includes that readmission data? And we can send that out. Absolutely, I will get that for you. Great, thank you. All right, and then uh, we have a question here from Kathy, who says uh, she would like to know how other organizations do the handoff uh, that work in a high-volume outpatient surgery center. So anything, any advice or, or, or uh, best, practices you, best practices you've seen regarding high-volume outpatient surgery centers? Well, I've not personally worked in outpatient surgery center. I've had outpatient as part of our facilities, but I, I cannot answer that question. Okay. Uh, perhaps we can do some research on the Perfect Serve side and see, uh, see if we can find some best practices to provide uh, to Kathy. So thanks for your question there. Uh, let's see. We have, let's see, we have another question here. Uh, similar, it's, this is outpatient as well, uh, coming from Denise. She says, any suggestions for transitions to ambulatory care and nursing home and home health? Uh, so any thoughts on tran care transitions to those outpatient settings? Well, being a recipient from a lot of other facilities, acute care, non-acute as well, we, um, one of the most crucial things is the med reconciliation and is one of the most difficult things. So from a safety perspective, I know we're all looking for the most efficient use of our time, but we, I think we need to do it in the reverse. We need to create the safest process and then back in the efficiency, because what's the safest is not always the quickest, and quick can cause a problem. So what I would say, anybody going from ambulatory care to another facility, you really want to make sure that the receiving facility has the diagnostic information they need. So what were they there for, and then why are they coming here, and all the backup information. So those diagnostic tests and those med reconciliation um, are key pieces of information to share. And one of the things that we have done here at Health South that Denise has initiated is a meeting of other chief nursing officers in the acute care hospitals. We had a meeting in January where we gathered the chief nursing officers to come to, and it was a pretty pithy little <laughs> meeting. It was called Avoid the Ding. We all know what it means to get dinged on our Medicare. So with ACT transfers, we're trying to avoid that, number one, for the patient, number two, for our pocketbooks, and also for our, our organizations we work for to keep our Medicare rating. So the Avoid the Ding luncheon, that we had little hotel bells put out uh, at the table. We actually delivered hotel bells to um, the chief nursing officers as a little gimmick so that they would get interested in the meeting. We had them come. We had an open forum where our staff, we had nursing, we had pharmacy, case management, we had physicians there as well, and, and leadership come to talk just about 
the smooth transition of patients, whether they're from the handoff direct from the acute care hospital on the admission or back to the hospital, and what needs needed to be met for patient safety and for a smooth transition. And Denise can probably share a couple of outcomes from that, a positive outcomes that we've had since January. Well, one of, one of the um, simplest things we identified was making it easy for the staff to have the conversation. We talked about that in the presentation. Um, what we handed out was the phone numbers and who they should contact. So if the transferring facility can't reach the person they need, they're going to give up. If it takes too long for me to get the information I need, I'm not going to look for it. I'm just going to move on to the next thing. It's a fast-paced environment, as we all know. So making sure they had the right numbers and the right contact information, although sounds so simple and like, of course, everybody should have had that, we didn't. So we created cards, and Karen had them handed out with all our rehab liaisons to the facilities. So now they have the right numbers so they could get right to the charge nurses on each unit to give the report. So things as simple as that can make a world of difference. Yes. Guys, they were simple laminated half sheet of cards that we called the nurse report card. And it had telephone numbers for morning shift, evening shift, and if they couldn't get the shift supervisor or nursing supervisor, we actually had a dedicated line for a nurse call report. So that, that information was always provided. We also had education and reinforcement to our rehab liaisons working in the acute care hospitals, bringing the admissions to us about the importance of nurse call report, uh, and really emphasize um, transition of care starting in 2017 with Denise's leadership. Um, any other questions? Uh, we do have a couple of more questions here. Uh, we have one from Dong who asks, is there a standard uh, in whether the handoff uh, communication should include both normal and abnormal findings or just abnormal? The, the Joint Commission does not get that specific on, in their standard. Um, I would say typically you want to, if there has been a change in condition, so if you go with the hemoglobin, if there's a normal hemoglobin, I don't need to report the hemoglobin. But if the patient had a low hemoglobin and it was treated and now it's normal, I want to repeat, I want to report that. I want to report that the, it's worked. The, they got one unit and now their hemoglobin is 10 and we're good, we're not giving any more blood. So it, it's very personalized to the patient. To just repeat a bunch of normal labs is a waste of everybody's time. I could look that up. What I want to know is what are the variances. But sometimes that variance is a normal lab value because it was abnormal prior. I don't know if that makes sense. But you, that's what you want to report on. You want to report on the variances. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, we do have another question here. Uh, you mentioned huddles, uh, team and shift huddles in your presentation. Um, and this person says they find value in huddles, but other folks on the team often don't. Uh, do you have any advice on how to run huddles uh, quickly and efficient, efficiently so folks are willing to participate? Um, yes. We actually have done several different types of huddles. What I find is the most efficient is a stand-up huddle because then it's going to be short. If you're not sitting down, you're not comfortable, you're going to move on. Um, and it's structured, just like handoff shift report, you want to have very structured thing that you want to talk about so it's not just, so how is everybody today? Anybody have anybody to share? Anything to share? That's not going to be helpful. It needs to be run by someone. Typically, it's the charge nurse. And you want it to be interdisciplinary so everybody can share or hear the information. So as I stated before, if you just talked about fall risk, because that's obviously a big deal in rehab, because the patients are up and about, our, our falls tend to be a little higher than the acute care. Who is at really high risk? Who's really confused that we need to worry about? Okay, you need to know the guy in 215. We have a family dynamic going on in there. So it's very structured. I want to know who's at high risk in the acute care facilities, when I ran um, a 124-bed acute care facility, we had it very structured. I want to know who has a Foley, who has an IV line, because you have other measures for your core measures that you have to worry about. So you want to define what's important to your unit, have it run by somebody. I had sign-in sheets for accountability. Um, so you want to make sure people are showing up, but it's no more than 10 minutes. So it's a very quick round table to ensure that everybody knows what's going on on the floor.
Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we have another, uh, it's not a question, but more of a comment from one of our attendees, um, AFRI, who says um, they use SBAR printouts from their EMR for reporting. Uh, they use that in their ED and surgery, ICU, med surge, and OB. So I thought that was a nice comment from one of our listeners. Um, and speaking of SBAR, uh, we do have another question that says, um, we have used SBAR and it has been helpful. Uh, do you have any insight into team steps in that process? I have not used team steps. I actually started to uh, research it. I worked with an OB director and used it in another facility, um, but I have not personally worked with it. Okay, great. Um, we perfect at Perfect Serve. We do have a webinar on Team Steps. Um, we can certainly uh, include that in the follow up uh, to the webinar to answer that question as well. All right. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our Q and A. So, uh, so thank you for the great questions, and thanks to Denise and Karen for answering those. Um, I do want to just uh, give our attendees a little bit of information on Perfect Serve uh, so you kind of understand who we are and, and what we do in the healthcare space. Uh, Perfect Serve uh, supplies or is the um, we have we offer Perfect Serve Synchrony. Um, Perfect Serve Synchrony is a single healthcare communication solution with mobile and desktop interfaces. Uh, we provide secure messaging with dynamic intelligent routing. Uh, and you may wonder what dynamic intelligent routing is, and that is basically a, it's a propri proprietary technology uh, where we can deliver your message, your communication to the right person who can take action at the time you need them. So if you are a nurse, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure that you've had experiences where you couldn't get a hold of the right person you were trying to find who the right person was to contact at any given time, looking at call schedules. Um, we automate all of that and deliver, uh, deliver you to the right person at the time you need to find them. Um, Perfect Serve Synchrony also offers alerting and escalation. So if you, uh, if you uh, need to uh, alert groups, say for a stroke team or, um, or a rapid response team of some kind, we offer the ability to do that. And we can escalate messages as well. So if someone has not responded to you in a certain time, there's automatic es escalation of the message so you don't have to continually um, try to contact them. Uh, we also offer real-time call schedule management, so you can do that on the fly, which um, assists in uh, uh, eliminating the need for paper call schedules. Um, and for nurses, uh, it's, it's really about improving your nursing productivity, your team efficiency, and improving the patient experience, as Denise and Karen talked about today. We want to eliminate any non-value-added activity that you're doing on the floor and make sure that, um, that you're taking care, you have more time to take care of your patients, which is really what your goal is. Um, we want to make sure we decrease interruptions to care and reduce communication cycle time, so the time it takes you to find and reach someone who can take care of, um, take care of the patient need, uh, we, we shorten that time and get you to the right person when you need, uh, when you need them. Which then, of course, results in um, the elimination of care delays, faster care response time, uh, decreased patient wait times, and more efficient patient transitions, which is what we've been talking about today. So I uh, wanted to give you a little sense of uh, what Perfect Serve does um, uh, for healthcare providers and helping you um, really reduce the, the cycle time of communication and improve patient care and patient safety. And with that, what I will do now is uh, I would like to thank Denise and Karen from Health South for an amazing and educational presentation today. And thanks to our audience. Um, like Denise said at the beginning, we know your time is very valuable, so we appreciate you spending some of it with us today. Uh, watch your inboxes for an email from the CEU Institute with that link uh, to reserve your credit. Remember, you have to, um, to click on that link within 72 hours uh, to grab your credit. And you'll also receive an email from us here at Perfect Serve with a link to today's webinar uh, and some additional materials that we talked about on the call. 
Uh, and that concludes our webinar today. Please do take a moment to complete our short survey and tell us how we did. And otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thank you.